Hey everybody, Clay Archer, CEO DTC Technology. And today we're gonna to review Unify's Ethernet Surge Protector. We're gonna go over who it's for, we're gonna do a quick review of the unit, and we're gonna go over how you would install it properly. Just really quick for some perspective, I am a low voltage uh, licensed contractor in Florida and Georgia. Obviously there's gonna be different regulations in the area that you're in. Some of the code may be different, uh, and how you're supposed to install this may differ a little bit from zone to zone. But I'm gonna go over the main concept of it, in, in general, you know, especially if it's residential use, you're going to get the concept of it, how it would work and how to practically install it for your use case scenario. So without any further ado, I'm gonna get into who is this really for. Like I said, we're a low voltage installer in Florida and Georgia, which happen to be areas of a lot of electrical uh, activity, a lot of lightning activity. Um, you may be in an area where there is very little electrical activity. I'll throw a map up on the screen of the United States and where uh, lightning strikes are more prevalent. Obviously, if you're in coastal California, this probably isn't a device that you really are going to need. But if you are somewhere where there, are a lot of, there is a lot of electrical activity and you have something mounted outside of the office, are outside of the house, there are some practical steps that you can take to minimize the amount of damage a lightning strike or a close by lightning strike will do. Let me clarify this by saying a direct lightning strike to anything, uh, all bets are off. This is not gonna help you if the pole that you have a, uh, a Wi-Fi extender on is, or a camera or whatever, it's struck. The amount of electricity that's in a lightning strike obviously will just pass through any of this stuff. I'm gonna date myself a little bit here, but if you're old enough to have ever used a cordless phone, you know that when lightning strikes, anywhere near the, the cordless phone, you'll hear actually the, the electricity in the air on the cordless phone and it'll, it'll go and you'll actually hear an audible kick. And that's the electricity that's, uh, that's kind of ambient in the air. So what happens is you have these Cat6 cables run all over the place and they're long, basically, antennas. And so this ambient electrical uh, energy is in the air and your cable runs are gonna pick that up and it actually, causes a little bit of a voltage spike on that on that cable and it will damage equipment. So, you know, in Florida, we typically probably get three or four lightning strike damage calls a year where, you know, parts of a switch are broken, um, a network hard and the computer gets fried. And it's it's typical. That's just what's got, that's what happens when there's a lot of electrical activity in close proximity to these electronics. What Ubiquity has to combat the situation is a small Ethernet surge protector is actually the ETH SPG2. What it does is it provides ground in between the cable run and the piece of equipment that you're using. So the ideal way to use this is that you would have one at the device, you'd have a cable run, and at the other end of the cable run where it enters the building, you would have another one. Could be back by your rack or whatever. And there's a couple different ways to mount this, which I'll, which I'll go through. I will put in a caveat that any exterior run cable should be in a conduit. So as it comes out of the building, it should go into a conduit. It should go under the ground or along the building inside of a conduit, conduit to where it terminates. Exposed Cat6 cable is just gonna be more susceptible to ambient lightning or static electricity in the air. It's just a fact. So the more protection that you can put into it. To code in the United States, it typically should be in a conduit to its termination point. So uh, ideally you would exit the building in the conduit, it would go to a field box where it then goes into one, something like this, and then maybe out to the device that's on the other side of the field box. So I'm gonna go into the two use case uh, mounting scenarios that are in the box. You can see the device itself is, it's actually a pretty nice little small device here. There are two RJ45 connectors. Uh, and I think that it goes either way. You can go in and out on both of them. So it, it, it is bi-directional, it doesn't really matter. You can see in between the two RJ45 connectors, there is a little grounding bar there. And so basically what we're trying to do is get that grounding bar to a ground. Technique number one is going to be if you're pole mounting a camera, a Wi-Fi extender or something of that nature, it's going to be to install a wire strap, to strap it to the pole, and then to take a four and a half millimeter drill bit drill a hole right through the center here and then mount it with the included hardware, which is a machine screw there, um, that would go right through that and ground it to the pole. Of the two methods, I find this to be the, the more questionable of the two because it really depends on how good of ground you have of that pole. Is that pole a real proper ground? I do think that this device would provide some protection to the device that's on the pole. How much it, that's going to do depends on the quality of the ground there. So that would cover the one on the pole. The second method is for the, the device that's either at the building or in the, the server room. So you would actually mount, wall mount the device and then you would take a grounding cable. I've got a 16 gauge ground wire here that I've made. Uh, this is just a little sample wire. And you would go ahead and take that wire 
and you will mount it with a number six machine screw to the device. So when that's done, it's gonna look a little something like this. So we've got a uh, number 16 cable coming out of there. We put a little eye on it. I will tell you that one of the kind of shortcomings of this install is that although they include the uh, machine screw to mount to a pole, they do not include the number six screw and number six nut to properly ground this. So I went just to, into Home Depot and grabbed that. I'll put a link to the, the proper hardware there as well. Um, then the 16 gauge wire that comes out of the end of this, I would then put that to a grounding block. Typically, if you have a commercial installation, you will have a grounding block installed on the wall. Your electrician will put that in there. Uh, we typically, you know, see number 10 wire here that we use for most of our other equipment. This does specifically say to use a 16 gauge wire, uh, which is a smaller wire, but this isn't for a major, major ele electrical strike. This is just basically for static and ambient electricity in the air. So that would go back to this block. You'd have a grounding bar for your office or your house that this block then goes to. Um, I'll, link, I'll put a link to Amazon where you can buy a, uh, a grounding rod for your house. Typically that's an eight foot copper bar that's sunk into the ground and uh, properly grounds the entire house. You probably already have one for your office or building, uh, but I'll just leave a link down below just so you have an idea what, what we're talking about there. Um, that really is it. So once this is then bonded into that ground bar, it is properly grounded on the inside. So uh, the reason you do both sides is obviously if lightning strikes in uh, there or there's static electricity in the air and it gets into the cat5 cable it goes both directions on that cable so uh, it this will protect both the equipment on the exterior at the other end and also your switch inside and i find that most often the the more expensive piece of equipment is in the inside you definitely do not want static electricity getting into a switch and getting to go to other equipment and, and damage your more expensive stuff so these are 12 dollars 50 they're relatively inexpensive um there is a probably more consideration for the labor to kind of install this, install this right. Um, but you know, probably all the, the little bits and bobs that you would need to, to do this properly for an exterior run is gonna cost you probably $25, $30. Well, if you got two of these, that's 25 for that. So let's just put another $10 for some various cables and cable ties and connectors. Um, I do think that it's worth the time and energy to do that, especially if you're in an area where you get a lot of uh, static electricity outside. Um, also, you know, the more that you can cover up your Cat5 cable uh, in conduit, uh, all your ends, you know, uh, make sure that you don't have any, any exposed cable uh, for the Cat5 cable. I think that goes a long way in protecting you as well. You don't want to leave any exposed copper or like any exposed cable uh, as much as you can. This isn't shielded cable like a coax cable, but it is it definitely susceptible to this kind of static electricity and ambient electricity from lightning. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. I'm sure there will be some other opinions about this. Some people may be from different regions that have different electrical code. I'd love to hear what you have to say in the comments. I've seen a couple of reviews on these devices and I, I never saw anybody that kind of went through it from a contractor's perspective where you, you really do have to ground it and make sure that it's working. I'm sure that if you just put this up and you mounted this and that you don't ground it, it's gonna give you a little bit of protection, but probably not very much. Really, I think the, the, the quality of any of these devices is gonna be the quality of the ground. I would like to see maybe a bigger than a 16 gauge wire on it, but I think that's probably the limitation of the way that the surge protector is uh, is built itself. It probably can only handle so much and anything more is probably overkill. But if you have any questions, again, leave them down below and uh, we'll see you guys in the next video.